here at 360 Church, and we'd like to welcome you if you're here in person or you're joining us by internet. Uh, it's all going to be the same experience except for the commercials uh, if you're on the internet. So if you're here in person, you have a better uh, time, we hope, uh, than those who will have to watch us from a long distance. Uh, you know, the music industry is the source of all kinds of unusual <laughs> phenomena. Uh, you know that if you uh, listen to music, you watch the Grammys. And maybe one of the most unusual that we've had recently was uh, the performance at a recent music festival by Tupac Shakur. Uh, he did a trio, I guess we'd have to call it, with Dr. Dre and Snoop. Um, how old is Snoop Dogg? He's like 90 or something. He's He's been around a long time, hasn't he? So every time I see him perform, I don't want to hear anything about old people can't start churches because obviously the guy's still got it going on. So he and Dr. Trey are out there on stage at this festival, and all of a sudden, boom, Tupac shows up and uh, does this uh, rap and the music and, and the whole thing, and they're talking to him and going back and forth and uh, creating a, a pretty dramatic uh, show, which uh, is made even more dramatic by the fact that Tupac's been dead for 15 years. And so what is dazzling about this performance is that it's a hologram. Yeah. And people all over are wondering, how did they do this? And the closest anyone can determine so far is basically it works like a giant overhead projector. That's an ancient piece of technology that <laughs> preceded the video projector. <laughs> which shines a huge uh, chunk of light down on the stage onto an angled piece of glass that the audience is unable to see. And then through or off of that glass, the image comes uh, and strikes a piece of mylar, which gives a 3D kind of effect. So when viewed from a seat uh, out there in the dark, it looks like you have a three-dimensional person standing there. Now, no one really knows if this is an actor who's been photoshopped to look like Tupac, or if it's totally CGI, or if it's some ultra secret, we'd have to kill you if we told you a combination of the two. But apparently at this festival, it was so effective that Snoop and Dre are thinking about touring with this hologram. And I think what we're going to see is pretty much an explosion of holographic superstars who are going to come back from the grave yeah. to entertain us from yeah. the other side in this three-dimensional form. Uh, it's amazing what you can do with light. Mm -hmm. You know what my favorite thing is that I own? Now, most people would say it's, it's the iPad because of your whole obsessive, addictive, you need an intervention relationship with it, but that's not really true. My, my favorite thing that I own uh, is a black 18-inch aluminum flashlight, which at this very moment is on my bedside table. <laughs> and it has a halogen beam and you know, this many D-cell alkaline batteries. And sometimes uh, I enjoy this uh, so much that I turn it on in the daytime just to see what the light looks like. <laughs> And I think, man, that's some flashlight. You have to be a man to understand this, really. So just ride along for a second. Uh, it also makes a really handy home defense weapon because it's right in, next to your bed, and it's uh, really heavy and long. And it's sort of like a nightstick for people who aren't law enforcement officers. So there's something about the light that it shines that I find just fascinating. And, and so I, I'll look at it even when it's not dark just to admire it. And so I just, I totally love this thing. There's just something about light that is uh, unlike really anything else. Uh, it's it's a, a phenomenal kind of an experience. Uh, maybe I came into an appreciation of this about 10 years ago when I visited an open air mall in Southern California. And I was on my own, I was on the road. It was after an event was over. I was kind of winding down. And so I was drifting through some uh, high-end retail, you know, kind of window shopping, you know, where you don't buy anything, but you look and mm, pretend that you could if you wanted to, even though that's really just a bald-faced lie. And so you drift through all these retail spaces, and I was walking along down the mall, the kind without a roof, you know, that was built in Southern Cal probably in the 80s, I would guess. And uh, I'm coming from uh, the, the heartland. I'm, I, I've been living in a forest at this point. And uh, down the mall on the left, I see this glow coming out, uh, and I walk uh, further down, and I find myself standing in front of a gray, flat metal facade with a big white apple. Yeah. 
and the apple is glowing, the Southern California sun is setting over the Pacific Ocean, and in the gathering twilight, this white, lovely, white, effervescent pours out of what I thought was retail, but turns out to be a little piece of heaven called the apple store. Now, at this point, I'm so new to California, I call my wife and say, honey, there's a store <laughs> where they sell nothing but Apple computers. Imagine, now, I never actually touched one at this point. I had heard about them and seen them on TV, but never touched one. I was so thrilled that it was virtually a religious experience for me, just to bask in the glory emanating from Steve Jobs, who will probably be back at the next Apple convention as a hologram. <laughs> and, and the technology that this that this represented. There's just something about the something about the light. I was so drawn to it that this image just rooted in my heart. It, it's probably not a wonder then that the Bible uses light as an image for communicating powerful things about God, for telling us about God's nature, about uh, God's character, God's attributes, what it's like to have a friendship with God is often communicated in terms of light and its opposite number, darkness. Uh, this is nowhere more evident except in uh, perhaps the Gospel of John than in a letter in the New Testament called 1 John. Historically, we attribute that to the same person that wrote the Gospel of John, and it heavily uses the notion uh, that God is identifiable by the light that just pours out of them like it pours out of the Apple store. When you're in front of the Apple store, it's like the place can't help itself. It glows like the little apple in the back of your laptop, and God is the same way. It just, it, it just comes flooding out of him. Now, this book doesn't really get a lot of attention from people. Uh, for one thing, it's kind of short. It, in our terms, it's only about the length of a 10-page term paper, and so uh, that, that's fairly small in, in Bible terms. Uh, another thing about it is that the language in it is pretty simple. It's not really fancy enough to attract language scholars. So maybe not a lot of attention there, not getting a lot of love. And uh, the other thing that's really uh, annoying about it is that it, uh, it's impossible to outline because it's not written in a linear fashion. Sure. Now, it can be done, but you have to really, you have to work on it. Uh, the closest anyone has gotten is simply to describe it orga as organized like a spiral with ideas and things that wrap around and around and around, emphasizing basic things and communicating them as was common in the ancient world, since this document is written to followers of Jesus in the Roman Empire of the first century. Repetition was how you drove a point home. It's like listening to a bad sermon that tells you the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Or, like a Bruno Mars song. I was captured, captivated by Bruno's performance at the Grammy Awards. I just, he, I really knew nothing about him. He burst into my consciousness. And so, uh, uh, and, and so I hear Grenade on the radio all the time. And I, I, I began to wonder myself, what is it like to write a song if you're Bruno Mars? Like, where did Grenade come from? So he's sitting in Starbucks, right? And he's, he's thrown down 14 shots of espresso, and he's thinking, Brain, train, rain, blade. Yeah, that's a hit. And he starts writing it all down. And he gets words as are uh, similar to the ones that uh, are on your handout this morning. Uh, I'd catch a grenade for you. I'd throw my hand on a blade for you. I'd jump in front of a train for you. You know, I'd do anything for you. Really? His point is to make the point by repeating it over and over and over in so many different ways. And in a way, this is why 1 John is maddening yeah. sometimes to people who would like to analyze it and break it down one, two, three, because it just says two or three basic things and does them by re repetition. Last week we said that one of those basic things is that God is life. Today we're going to talk about the fact that God is light, and next week that God is as love. Light can do pretty amazing stuff. Now people have been thinking about light long before John ever wrote about it. Uh, the Greeks had a scholar who initially believed that light came out of your eyes like beams. In other words, like your eyes were tiny flashlights and they shone light on everything and that's why you were able to see them. 
Uh, a, a later Greek uh, philosopher and scientist believed that that wasn't really true at all, that light actually moved in lines, and he started talking about reflection and mirrors and so forth. Uh, the Romans pushed all of that forward with additional work. Uh, scientists in India, uh, centuries uh, before uh, Jesus walked the earth, uh, speculated that light might be a small atoms, of particles of fire that moved around. Uh, through the earth, and uh, people eventually began to realize that they could manipulate light, and so early lenses were developed. The earliest, uh, about 700 BC, have been uh, excavated in Assyria, and uh, the Greeks and Romans both created lenses uh, made out of glass vessels filled with water. No one actually thought to make a lens out of glass until the Middle Ages. Kind of like since the invention of the wheel, it took how many thousands of years to put two little ones on the bottom of a suitcase and a handle on the top? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the same kind of idea. Uh, and so eventually, uh, people began to manipulate light and form it and shape it for their own uh, convenience. And John takes this concept, this central thing to our existence, without which there is no photosynthesis, without which there is no life, and he writes about it this way in chapter 1, verse 5, and then again in a passage we've given you on your handout in chapter 2. He says, this is the message we have heard from him, meaning Jesus, and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, meaning God, a liar, and his word is is not in us. Now John's writing something pretty stark. To come out into the light, my path to that is forgiveness. Yeah. And that forgiveness is only available in one way. It's by, in faith, receiving what Christ has done for me on the cross as a substitute for what I deserve. And through that forgiveness... It's Apple Store time. Without that, no matter what else I have, or what other merits I possess, or how spiritual I am, or what great ethical conduct I bring into the world, which is all good for other reasons, none of that adds up to light. And when God cleanses me, whether it's for the first time when I receive Christ as the center of my life or whether it's in a time when I've just fouled up and I need to be forgiven, when, when he receives me in that way and grants me by his grace that kind of washing and cleansing and forgiveness, the lights come on in my life. And you know the wonderful thing about the Apple store is the other people who are in there. Because until the lights are on, you don't really see anybody else but yourself. That's why John writes this in chapter 2, verse 7. Beloved, don't you like that, how he says that to them? Beloved. You hear that in some, in some, uh, some churches. Uh, pastors will, when they're introducing a part of their sermon, they'll say, Beloved, and it's taken literally here from 1 John. I'm writing you no new commandment but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him, Jesus, and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling but whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes 
when Jan and I lived in uh, the woods in Missouri, we were close to a tourist place called Silver Dollar City, which was an exact uh, tur touristic, is that an adjective? A, a touristic representation of a mining town in the Ozark Mountains in the late 19th century. Now, uh, I'm not interested in that in the first place. Uh, and the second problem with it was that once you got there, it was filled with places where you could buy stuff that you didn't want. So, but we had friends who loved going there. I mean, three, four times a year, they'd buy season tickets to, to go there. Uh, and I went once or twice just because we loved their friends and wanted to be with them. But there was one thing there that was interesting, which was a huge cave. Now this was not created by a corporation. Uh, this is something I really wanted to see. It was an amazing natural formation. It was called Marble Cave. Originally, they thought marble was there, so it was originally called Marble Cave. They changed the name to Marble. And so you round up all these people. It's time to go into the cave, and you walk down 600 steps to get a few hundred feet deep. Ultimately, you'll be 1,000 feet down. And you go into the largest cathedral room, which is a cave term, I guess, uh, in uh, North America, and it's this massive formation. You're way underground, and uh, it's, it's really an amazing place. It's like nothing I've ever seen, because I've never really been in a, in a cave in, in my life before. And so the guide explained everything. It was so interesting. It was like, when do you ever get to pick up the area that you live in and look at the underside? It was like turning a carpet over to look at the back, and it was unbelievable. So we walked down further, steps and steps and steps and steps and steps and uh, more steps followed by additional steps. And we finally got to 1,000 feet deep, and we're in uh, the heart of the place. And the guide announces to us now, don't anybody move because we are turning off the lights. They switch off the electric light. And we are plunged into a form of darkness that I have never experienced before or since. The abject absence of even one photon. Yeah. There yeah. is not a photon, particle, or wave right. going through that space. It, it, if, it, it, this, it's, it's like a whole huge quantity of dark matter was pumped into this cave. And here we are, you're immersed in it. It feels like being underwater. And you can hear people going, <laughs> like that. And the anxiety level's going up. And I'm thinking, I'm sure they've got liability insurance for this situation. Because, <laughs> I mean, if you have a weak heart, you're dropping right here. You don't, there's, you don't have a hope of getting out of this place alive. And I'm thinking, oh, OK, 15 or 20 seconds of this. That's about enough. I'm already underground. I'm buried alive. And the big uh, attraction is you turn the lights off? You've got to be kidding me. What are you, what are you doing? John's kind of saying that uh, outside of the light, this is all there is. Yeah. I mean, I know I'm there because I can feel my heart pounding. Mm -hmm. I can feel myself breathing too loud. I'm embarrassed about not being manly enough you know, to take this on without flinching. Mm -hmm. um, I can kind of hear a few people shuffling a little bit on the rocks under our feet, but I can't see anyone. I'm hugely aware of myself, but there is no Apple store here. And honestly, in that moment, no one counts to me. Just me and how am I going to make my way through the dark. John says, we're not going to have a very good time with that because there's going to be stumbling and falling. Man, if I had taken one step in that place, I would have been flat on my face. Darkness is hard to navigate. And when I'm surrounded by it, it has a population of one, which is me. John's inviting people to turn the lights back on by asking God for his forgiveness. And as we receive that, I begin to see you. When the lights are on, I can see you. When things are illuminated, you're there. What happens is you become real to me instead of being an enemy or a stereotype or some vague idea or just another person who's uh, in line with me at the DMV for three or four days. 
I see you. You're actually, you have, you have value. You have three dimensions. You have, it's, it's not about your language or, or, or your color or any of that external stuff. I actually see you because the lights are on. And that's how we have fellowship. That means close relationship with one another because we can actually see each other enough to begin to connect, to begin to care, and at the ultimate extension of it, to begin to sacrifice for each other. When they turned the lights back on, they loaded us all into a train. We were a thousand feet underground, and the train starts going clank, 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 clank up this long track. And it feels like you're on that front hill of a roller coaster, you know the one? Except at the end, there's no, ah, there's no screaming. We clanked all the way to the top. And as we came out into this cool air, we were back in a, a different kind of light, in sunlight. And we had come through that experience as this kind of a group and had sort of found each other because we had all seen the lights turn on simultaneously. I'll always share that with the people I was in the cave with that day. And you know, in the rest of life, you always share a bond with the people who were there when the lights went on. All of us today are uh, somewhere in relationship to light or darkness. John's not describing a shadow world. He's saying there is light and there is dark. In the cave, there's off and there's on. And in the world, there is off, where I'm on my own, and there's on, where I'm in a faith relationship with Jesus. To embrace that is to embrace light. And to embrace light is to embrace other people. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads with me for just a moment, if you, uh, if you would, please. And our band's going to come and lead us in worship and prepare us for communion. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment to, uh, to pray for you and to, to ask you this. If uh, today is a, a day where maybe the light that is God has become just a little more real for you, and you feel like I'm a I'm open to taking a step of faith in this direction. I'm open to reaching out and putting arms of faith uh, around God today and in the confidence that God's arms of love are reaching back toward me. Uh, I've done enough stumbling around and I'd like to step out into the light today. We're not going to uh, single you out or make you feel embarrassed at all, but if that's the inclination of your heart, I ask you to just slip a hand up and put it down when no one's looking around and be able to uh, to pray over you today before you leave. Anybody else? Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us Jesus so that we can even know that there is light. And that through uh, him, we can come out of darkness, that there is no more cave for us. And that in that light, we can really find each other. God, we pray that by your spirit, you would move in our hearts and lives this week to just make that more real than it ever has been. We thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name.